Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce Tony to you. Uh, Tony Merriman was born and raised in the south of New Zealand. He did his PhD at the University of Otago in Dunedin, followed by postdoctoral training at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. He returned to the University of Otago in 1998, where he established a research program studying the genetics of gout and other metabolic diseases. Uh, Tony is going to talk about the genetics of metabolic diseases in the Pacific. Thank you, Tony. Well, um, thank you very much, Donald, and it's so wonderful to be in um, Fiji. It's my first visit, and I always remember um, my mother was always so enthusiastic about Fiji. She came here when she was 19 or 20 with all of her friends, and it's a trip she's always talked about over the years. Now, um, I, before I talk about the genetics of metabolic disease in um, Maori and Pacific in New Zealand, I like to do a, a little Gene 101 course here because I think it's very important, at following on from what Peter said, is that understanding the relationship between inherited genes and environment in the um, modern epidemic of metabolic disease is quite important. So six little ballet dancers from the town of Dunedin in the south island of New Zealand, the home of the Highlanders, and obviously Waisaki, Waisaki no ho lo. So I get to sing that most Friday or Saturday nights and enjoy Waisaki no ho lo. But what I want you guys to do is you get one vote each. Donald is not allowed to vote because he has seen this one before. And the, it, in, in Waipiro Bay, and neither are these guys, but choose which one is my daughter, okay? One vote each, six girls, they're all about five or six years of age, living in Dunedin in the early 2000s. So we'll start with the girl on the left, and raise your hand if you think she is my daughter. Nope, the one second from the left. Nope, third from the left. Okay. A, a smattering. Um, she is very cute, that one. Um, the one third from the right. Second from the right. And the one on the, on the right. Okay. Well, you guys are pretty good at it. Um, collectively, you picked the two shortest children. <laughs> and... And I'll tell you which one it is um, soon, but we need to do some genetics. So this, this illustrates the heritability of height. We know height is heritable. You know, we end up being of a similar height to our parents, plus or minus a little bit. And what we know, and this is a really important point, is that 80% of the reason why these girls all vary in height is because the genes they inherit from their parents. Okay, and, but that's not to say that environment isn't important. Let's, let's cast ourselves back. The, these are all girls of European um, descent, and two or three hundred years ago, let's say two hundred years ago, they might all have been living in the east end of London. Very little sunlight, poor nutrition. They would have all been on average shorter, okay, a little bit shorter. But there would still have been that variation in height. So genetics is still important in explaining why people vary in height, but the importance of the environment is modulating the average height. And it's no different if we look at weight you know, the, or diabetes. The current environment modulates the average in diabetes prevalence, the average in weight, the average height, the average of gout 
prevalence, but genetics is still very important to answer that really critical question, one question that is so important in, in developing new ways of addressing the, the epidemic, why do some people get diabetes in this environment and others don't? And that's really what we want to do. Now, for those of you who are wondering, she's the one on the right, so the shortest one. Now, um, 19 years of old, I'm just Snapchatting me to ask her help to help her clean up my, her flat when she gets back, when I get back home for a flat inspection. Nah, I'm not doing that. So here, here, here's some um, pie graphs. So height is 80%. So, so these are graphs that explain why some people get disease and some people don't in the current environment. So 80% of the variation in height is genetic. About See, 50 to 70 percent of the variation in weight or body mass index is genetic. Schizophrenia, 80 percent of the variation of why some people get schizophrenia, others don't, is genetic. And type 2 diabetes also has quite a significant genetic component. Now, I, I like, uh, this is a um, graph that one of the speakers at the HUI that Peter mentioned, my Piero Bay, put up, and I think it's very, very informative. Okay, so if we this is showing the um, change in BMI in a, in a typical European um, population from 1984 when the, the, the obesity crisis began to now. And if we wait till it gets to 1984, the average is obviously a lot less, but notice the shape of the curve in 1984. So we'll come back. Now it's a nice normal, normal shaped distribution. Now, if we look at the shape in 2014, it's, I'll use this. It's, no, it's got a real tail to it, okay? So what we can um, um, assume or hypothesize from that is that while the weight has gone up for, on average for everyone, there is a group in the population where the modern environment is impacted more severely to make their BMI even higher, okay? So we're getting a tail. So it indicates this impact of the environment more, more severely on the subgroup, and we can hypothesize that that subgroup may have genetic variants that, um, that are strongly um, promoting weight gain. Um, well, I'm not going to go through this, but I just want to make a couple of points from this. This is a slide I use for my genetic students. But really the genetic architecture of um, in, the, in the Maori and Pacific populations is, is similar broadly throughout the world. We have <clears throat> all human populations share common genetic variants that, um, that, were, that arose in the populations before we split out to become different, different populations, so many thousands and millions of years ago. And these common genetic variants all work together to have a, um, a shared between populations and have collectively a, um, a small effect, or collectively a large effect, individually a small effect. And one thing I should mention, have mentioned back here about the genetics is that we know for height that that there are literally hundreds of genes throughout the genome that contribute to height, and it's their collective action that um, determines somebody's height. And this is in this group here. So we have the the, the um, so we have down here. So these are common genetic variants that have a weak effect. Over here we have very rare genetic variants such as the ones that cause Mendelian diseases, familial diseases like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy that have a very strong effect. So these variants here are shared between populations. It's these variants here, the ones that are rarer, less common, but are population specific and have a stronger effect that we're studying within the Morris Wilkins Center. And here's an example of a, um, an obesity gene. So this child here is in a um, Pakistani family. And this family is consanguineous and it, and it has a mutation in the leptin gene. And the leptin protein controls hunger. Okay, it's released by fat cells to, to, um, to let us know when we're, when, our, um, when we're eating enough food and we don't feel hungry anymore. This is a three-year-old boy and he's got a mutation in the leptin gene. And what that means is, is that he, doesn't, he, he feels hungry all the time. He can eat and eat and eat, and he'll still feel hungry because there's no leptin signaling to his brain that he's full. Okay, so apparently in this family, the, um, 
they would even have to put um, locks on the fridge, on the freezer. He would eat cold, um, frozen fish fingers. But um, the, the doctors here were able to, um, this is the boy at nine years of age, with replacement with leptin, so injecting, injecting him with leptin. Okay, I'll put this up as an illustration that in this particular case of obesity, it's all genetic, but it's not going to be like that for common obesity because there's not many people that actually have this mutation and mostly the leptin, we, we all have leptin, but it just doesn't work as well. So it's not, unfortunately, this is not the magic pill. This was discovered 20 years ago. But anyway, just to make the point. The other point I like to make about, um, you know, my, my major research interest is in gout. And there's a belief, um, a, a really widespread belief that gout is all about diet. So if we can manage people's diets, we will reduce serum urate levels and therefore we won't get gout. And we know that... Um, that is not really going to work well. And the reason why we know is that gout has been present in the Pacific for thousands of years. In fact, it's been reported in Vietnam in a Neolithic population 6,000 years ago. So you can look at ancient bones, and this is from um, Tioma in Vanuatu, the, the, from the Lapita population, and see this little um, cavity here. That's due to the tophus that form in gout, accumulation of uric acid crystals and and burrow into the bones, classic for gout. So therefore, you know, gout has been present in Maori and Pacific populations for many thousands of years. So really, um, in the prevalences in these these bone in, in these symmetries that you find these bones and is actually very similar to the modern prevalence. So it's a very strong argument that it's not all about the modern environment for gout at least. Um, and very recently, and this is work done by Halle Buckley at the University of Otago, there's a, um, a type of um, arthritis called diffuse idiopathic skeletal hypostosis. And this is very strongly associated in the modern population with diabetes and obesity, so it's a metabolic marker. And, and Halle can also find evidence for DISH in the skeletal remains from um, not only Vanuatu but other places throughout the Pacific and that's an indicator that diabetes at least may and we're, we're less certain about that than gout may have also been present um, pre-westernization. <clears throat> so we're of the view that these chronic common chronic conditions need better medical approaches and this is a book um, written by um, a couple of um, guys, Peter Cacciapoli and Rhys Cullen, and Rhys Cullen is um, in the Waipareira Trust in, in West Auckland, and this book was written over 10 years ago, and it created a bit of a storm in New Zealand when it came out. And this is Rhys's, the, the, these men's view. Almost all of the research funding on the prevention of diabetes in Māori is spent on trying to find ways to make Māori eat less and exercise more. And when diet and exercise do not work, Māori are blamed. Maori are more likely to become insulin resistant and diabetic because they are Maori, and um, and then they stated the cause is genetic. Um, and these authors advocated an immediate medical approach, so they they were they were um, proponents for a poly pill. You know, give people a pill with um, various dr um, drugs like aspirin, etc., um, rather than um, trying to intervene in lifestyle right from the word go. So we, um, certainly in my research group, we're, we're trying to um, advocate for intensified biomedical research which will help inform better medical and public health interventions and, and inform actually this, this new buzzword, if you like, of precision health. So precision public health interventions, precision medical interventions, where you can intervene either with lifestyle interventions or, or the right type of drug based on um, people's genetic profiles and, and other risk factors. And so the Morris Wilkins Centre project we're doing is um, studying 600 Maori and Pacific people with and without diabetes and obesity. And we're looking for genetic variants that are present in the Maori and Pacific population but absent in other populations throughout the world, and, and we are finding them. And we believe that the finding these genetic variants will actually destigmatize um, gout, obesity and diabetes in New Zealand and, and we have some um, good evidence from the um, communities that we're working with that this will be the case knowing that there is a genetic basis and it's not all about people with um, you know 
bad lifestyles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that there is a genetic basis for disease helps to destigmatize. And I firmly believe that destigmatization is a crucial initial step to move forward with um, biomedical and public health interventions in the wider population. It'll open doors, we hope it'll open doors for better medical intervention and targeted behavioural intervention once you understand. So for example, if there are people who are um, morbidly obese and they have um, genetic um, poly um, variants and genes that control their hunger urges, then really telling people like that that you've got to eat less in the modern environment is a complete waste of time because they feel hungry all the time. So what one might do with um, people with that genetic background is come up with um, you know, more intensive behavioural um, interventions one-on-one -on -one with those people to try and help them manage the hunger or develop a, um, a drug that can um, dull the hunger urges. So we have community-partnered research, exactly the same research that Peter mentioned before, and we wish to use genetic information to stratify into groups for targeted interventions. And here's some examples of genes that we're finding now. And in fact, we're quite excited about this top one. It's a gene called OCT3, which stands for Organic Cation Transporter 3, that has a um, Polynesian-specific genetic variant that's found only in Polynesia and possibly in Fiji, we don't know. Um, and this variant exports metformin out of muscle cells. And, and, and maybe that people, so metformin is the first, um, the first line drug treatment for diabetes and perhaps 15, approximately 15% 15 of Polynesian people are getting a, a diabetes are getting a drug that's never going to work for them or, or even worse may actually do them harm. And so we're going to follow up this finding to see if people with this genetic variant actually respond um, to ascertain their response to metformin. Um, here's a couple in gout, and for example, here's a, into a, a, an immune system gene, interleukin 37, and the immune system is very important in gout. And this, there's a Polyne another Polynesian-specific variant in 5% of people, and if they have this genetic variant, it completely removes a, um, a break, if you like, or a, um, a regulatory step in in the response of the immune system to uric acid crystals in the joints, which cause gout. And for example, um, the people with this variant with a single copy have earlier onset of gout by average of four years. So one could think about um, screening if, if you have an individual with hyperuricemia, elevated uric acid levels in this genetic variant, maybe we might want to um, put them on urate it will suggest urate lowering therapy before they get gout rather than dealing with the gout when it will quite likely come. But I want to just finish by focusing on this CREB RF gene. Now this gene was found in the Samoan population um, in Samoa in America Samoa, another Polynesian specific genetic variant by researchers from Brown University, Steve McGarvey in the States. And they screened the entire genome in 3, 000, uh, roughly 3,000 um, Samoan people and they found a genetic variant in this gene that increases body mass index but counterintuitively what we know about the relationship between increased weight and diabetes, it protects from diabetes so it's a so-called favorable adiposity genetic variant. And that this gene had previously not been implicated in either diabetes or obesity. There's very little known about it, but the genetic variant that in, in the Samoan population that raises BMI and, and protects from diabetes is quite common, about 25% um, prevalence. So we went and um, studied this variant in the New Zealand population and, and without dwelling on these pictures, we replicated the effect of increased BMI and we studied New Zealand Maori, Cook Island Maori, Samoa and Tonga Nui, and Pukapuk and, and, other, and, and other Polynesian groups within New Zealand. So it's having this, exactly the same effect in New Zealand as it's having in Samoa, pretty much exactly. Um, one, one single copy of this gene increases um, BMI by not far off two units, and that equates to an increase in weight of somebody who's about one7 um, meters tall um, of about four kilograms. So it's quite a significant um, effect on weight. It protects from diabetes, but very interestingly, it's also one of the strongest um, height influencing genes known. A single copy increases your height by one and a quarter centimeters. 
and so that that was an interesting observation. So it led us to um, think about BMI in this context, and and we um, like probably most people in the audience, um, are, are, we realise that BMI is a poor measure of adiposity and weight, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, particularly in um, Pacific populations. And this is illustrated by our New Zealand study led by um, Lindsay Plank. And basically, if you take um, different populations, there's European, Maori, Pacific, Asian, and Chinese living in New Zealand, and you take somebody with a um, body and measure their body fat by DEXA scanning, if you just arbitrarily pick a figure here of about 37%, 38% body fat, you'll see in um, Asian Indian people that it equates to a BMI of um, roughly 30, okay? Whereas in individuals of other populations, say Chinese, European, and particularly Maori and Pacific, if you have a BMI of 30, your percent body fat is way lower, okay? So if we're thinking about percent body fat, for example, being a, a true measure of um, adiposity in the, in the association of adiposity with other metabolic conditions, then BMI it really is a poor measure. Um, so with the study, it's just, so this is leading into a new, in a new Morris Wilkins Center project, similar um, that, that, that Peter talked about, um, and I'm just gonna provide you with a few more details to, to finish off with. So what we want to do is, particularly with this Kreb RF variant, is ask the question, and we, we are sort of thinking that this, this gene actually, um, because it associates with height, it could be all more about bone mass and muscle mass, and not about fat mass and the way it increases BMI and protects from diabetes. So here's the new project that, um, that's, that's starting in Auckland, Wellington, Dunedin, and also in partnership with Ngāti Pro Haora and the Moku Foundation from, from Kaitaia. And it's, um, the key guy here is Troy Merrier, a um, relatively young um, researcher at Auckland who works with Peter. And we get, um, in this case, men in, and, and they have a five-hour laboratory visit where we measure their, or tr Troy measures their resting metabolic rate, takes a diet history, tests their um, response to a, a meal, so mixed meal tolerance test, does DEXA and MRI scans, and um, I got the slide off Troy and I said, that's not a got that's not a male is it it was clearly a female but um the, the the study focuses on men at this point in time and then we genotype and the purpose is to um correlate genotype with these what we call deep phenotypes so we're getting more deeply into um bmi here and these are preliminary um findings and i do believe it's about 50 individuals at the moment peter um and while they're not significant, and these were the preliminary data that were presented by Troy at the Hui and Waipiro Bay that Peter mentioned, we are getting an indication that the, here's the A and the X represents the Polynesian or Pacific specific genetic variant, is trending towards an increase in bone mineral density, trending towards an increase in lean mass, so that's bone and muscle mass, but not really having any effect on, on fat mass. So we're um, coming to the view there that this genetic variant protects from diabetes by having some role in um, controlling bone and muscle mass, and it may not be about adiposity in this case. And um, we've visited here with Offa um, and, and very much enjoyed meeting a wide range of people, and the Morris Wilkins Centre is hoping that a similar project can be established in Fiji with Fijian partners, you know, what is, we don't know what the prevalence of this Kreb RF variant and other genetic variants that, that we're identifying in the Pacific that could be, a, that could be very important for the health, um, metabolic health, causes of metabolic ill health in Fiji. So we don't know what, what the prevalences are in Fiji. Um, and to, uh, so in order to gain a better understanding of the biological basis of metabolic disease in Fiji, doing projects similar with the community to the one I just described. And if it's done on, a, in a, in a, on the partnership basis and involving um, collection of data with partners in, in Fiji like we're, we're doing in New Zealand, and our model is, is that those partners 
own and control the data that are collected and when then allow us to um, use that data to analyse and also provide opportunities for students from Fiji to um, do postgraduate projects um, analysing the data. So we hope that it can improve community understanding of disease and certainly one of the um, stories offer tells, tell, tells me regularly is that out in the Pacific communities in New Zealand people want to know what is going wrong with their bodies. You know the biology of of diabetes and kidney disease, etc. Destigmatisation. I've mentioned that, and then we hope it can translate into targeted or precision public health, and also into pharmacogenomic um, approaches as well. So I think it's my last slide. So I'll stop there, and both Peter and I will be very happy to take questions. Right. So we're open for questions now. Who'd like to go first? Um, I can, yes, uh, Dr. Spish. Are these tests available in clinical practice? That's <clears throat> one question. Second, we do have patients whereby uh, they are not obese, they are lean, but their diabetes is really uncontrolled. And this we find more in the indo fijian population than the Ito-K population. And in Fiji, uh, uh, we observed a difference in terms of the BMI or the weight and the metabolic diseases. So an uh, Indian man can be thin Indian man and he'll have triple vessel disease in his coronary arteries. Mm. Uh, they can have severe diabetes requiring insulin. But we don't know whether this is, uh, the, seems like there is a genetic component but is there anything done other places that would, or is there any different approach to their treatment? So I might leave the second one to Peter because he's a diabetes expert. But the first one, the, the, these genetic tests will be quite a, a way away from being in, in um, clinically available. I, I mean, we we're sort of looking towards a time when people's genome sequences become part of their medical records and then a genetic test can be run from the from the genome sequence according to what the doctor or GP is um, is interested in so I so, so they will be some way away we need to first do the research to fully understand the effects of these genetic variants and then do clinical uh, studies to integrate them into clinical care to see if they actually make a difference doing the genetic tests in clinical care and only then would it become um, available clinically but possibly as part of a genome as part of the medical record so that you don't have to order a genetic test for every single thing you might want to do as a, as a doctor. Um, in, a, in, a, in answer to your second question, um, the accumulating evidence is that the patterns of uh, you know, the genes affect the patterns of your uh, fat distribution and your energy metabolism, and more commonly in the uh, Fijian population, sorry, in the, sorry, in the uh, uh, Indian population and South Asian populations, you see a lot more fat accumulating. You would have seen that graph that Tony uh, showed, and what Tony's graph was showing is that that it's from a paper published a few years ago that shows at a BMI of 30, at which we say people are are obese. Uh, on average, uh, um, uh, Indian men will have 43% body fat already, huge amount of body fat. And that body fat uh, overflows from the fat store. Because actually having fat cells is a really good idea for the body because fat is a really toxic and dangerous uh, nutrient. And we don't want fat accumulating in our tissues. So we have fat cells. And actually fat cells are kind of like a petrol tank for your car. You can store lots of this dangerous energy source in, the, in your fat cells, away from danger. But it seems that uh, in, in Indian men who don't, can't produce enough actual fat cells, uh, that fat is still coming in from their diet and it ends up going to their liver. And particularly uh, fatty liver disease is, is more prevalent in, in those people. And that must be for genetic reasons. We don't know what they are yet. Once it uh, spills over from there, it goes into the pancreas as well, and you get fatty pancreas, and that really makes it hard for the beta cells 
to secrete insulin properly and um, really, really causes those problems that you're talking about, about getting enough insulin supply from the body and they have to be totally dependent on insulin. So yeah, there is a different biology going on there. And um, you know, for years we've thought of, of obesity as a bad thing. And overall, what we should be thinking of is too much fat in our body and, and getting into us is, is the bad thing. Actually, having some fat cells to protect you from all your dietary fat and to store that fat and keep it out of harm's way is kind of a good thing or protects some people. And you get some people who can put on a lot of fat and, and still not show the symptoms of diabetes because they're storing it in their fat cells. It's really the danger comes is when that comes back out into your blood with high fatty acids or gets um, high levels of LDL and things that, that will go into your uh, arteries and, the, and, the, and into the uh, atheromas or you're getting high levels uh, coming back and depositing into your, into your liver and other organs um, and, and, and stops them functioning. So uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, certainly there is a biological difference there. So maybe the treatment is we should give them some more fat cells and uh, transplant fat into them. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But, uh, but it's almost like that. They need to find a mecha mechanism to really... I, I would predict that in those people that you really need to keep them off anything fatty and keep them totally away from from a, from a fat diet because that's going to go straight to their liver and straight into their uh, pancreas. All right. Can someone else be running around with a microphone? Is that? Thank you for your interesting presentation. I'm quite curious as to the variant of Crab RF. Is there just a single variant that is associated with the increase in BMI, or is there any particular variant? I mean, if, are there more variants? Okay. So it's a single specific genetic variant that changes an amino acid. I can't remember the exact change in, in the protein, and we know very little about what the protein does and how that genetic variant affects a change in that protein, but it's one specific genetic variant. Um, and it seems to be, we know it's most prevalent in Polynesian populations, but it's also present in Micronesian at a lower prevalence populations. But the, the Melanesian populations that have been looked at so far, I think, from the Solomon Islands and one other population I can't remember, it wasn't reported in. And so therefore, um, in Fiji, we don't know what the prevalence is, but one single variant. I'm, I'm curious how that particular variant protects, protects against diabetes, but is um, associated with increased BMI. Naturally, yeah. we expect something that increases BMI to contribute to its diabetes. Yeah. Do, do you have any preliminary data how um, the molecular path we associated with the transcription of those variants? Yeah, yeah, so there's it's called a so-called favorable adiposity variant, and they have been described in other populations. So these variants exist. So I think um, understanding the pathways they're involved in will be important in understanding the relationship between BMI adiposity and diabetes. Yeah, I think clearly what our data is starting to show is that these people actually have a greater muscle mass, uh, and muscle is a good thing to make you more insulin sensitive because if you've got a lot of muscle, that means your insulin can you know, remove a lot more glucose out of your blood into that muscle. Uh, so that would make you more insulin sensitive. Also, muscle is, is more dense uh, than fat, and so that affects your weight versus your height measurements and your calculated BMI. I mean, we know in New Zealand that nearly every one of our All Blacks would rank as being uh, obese by BMI measurements. And that's not because of their fat, it's because of their dense muscle and their large amount of muscle relative to their height. And so I think that's what's happening in the Crab RF variant people. Our data is starting to show that they're going to have more muscle than, uh, than fat. It's going to be a musculature feature. What's amazing about it is that that one uh, single amino acid change in uh, arginine 457 to glutamine, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no one knows what it does yet. And it, uh, remember in the pictures I showed you, what we're doing at the Morris Wilkins Center is once we find those gene variants, we go back to study the biology to understand how that biology is being changed by that gene variant. And that's the phase we're in now. And this is the really exciting part to understand what that is doing and what it, how it affects people 
and what it means for their health. Now, this is a protective variant, so can we learn from that protective uh, function it has? Can we learn from that to help other people who don't have that variant? Can we learn lessons from that to help other people who don't have that variant to, to reduce their risk of diabetes? And that will be our aim of those studies. My last question, could these be the thrifty genes that has been suspected to be the cause of obesity among Pacific Islanders? Um, the crab breath. That, that's what Steve McGarvey suggested, but we don't believe. Um, I think the thrifty gene hypothesis is, is misplaced in the Pacific. Um, you know, the thrifty gene is all about getting a genetic variant that helps you get through the lean times and put on weight, etc., etc. That was relevant in very human, very early human evolution millions of years ago. And certainly, the, what, one of the things that we are trying we, we, with parallel research with Professor, Professor Lisa Madison Smith from Otago is understanding when these variants arose and why, you know. And, and, and we can assume that, um, you know, if you've got a genetic variant like the Kreb RF, our, our major hypothesis is that it's been selected for in a positive way, right? And, and certainly um, the, the major selective pressures in recent human evolution has been infectious disease. You know, a disease like malaria, for example, where we think the hyperuricemia throughout the Pacific is, due, is to give an enhanced response to the malarial parasite. So um, I would say, no, I don't believe it's a thrifty gene, um, but then I can't tell you what it could be. But I think the thrifty gene, um, it, you know, for example, it could be thrifty in the, in the sense that people who had the, the genetic variant might have had greater weight and, or, or for some reason been able to survive an infection better rather than being the um, gene that gets you through population periods of starvation or, large, or long ocean voyaging, which doesn't really, I don't think, fit with our knowledge of the settling of the Pacific. Um, I, I would say it's definitely, you know, we know about Pacific people already have higher, uh, have, have a lot of more muscle and bone. Uh, and that this is Krab RF may be the gene explaining that, but clearly there are also a subpopulation of people who have um, uh, uh, increased a propensity to accumulate fat stores as well, and that'll probably be other genes. And so the studies we're doing now are starting to show a whole range of other gene variants uh, that Tony didn't talk about today that we we really need to study in more detail. And it, probably it'll be one of those ones, the newly found ones that we haven't talked about today that will be explaining that. But ultimately, another really important point to point out is that none of these are, that, you know, not every Pacific person will have all of those genes. You know, that it might, these are genes found in maybe 15% of the population, 20% of the population, 25%, 15, 10%, you know. So each, each person has a real mix of all of these different genes and ultimately it'll be the It'll be the, the, the combination of all those gene variants that that particular individual has that will dictate how they will respond to the, to the environment. And, and, and um, so Kreb RF will be one part of that puzzle, but if you put Kreb RF together with, say, the OX3 variant that Tony talked about and the, um, uh, you know, the other variants, the, the picture becomes more, more complex. But yeah, there's, there are other genes out there to find, and, and that's what this research Pro, uh, centers that we are setting up. That's the aim of, of those. I'm sure you have questions. We have 10 more minutes at least. No? Uh, yes. And can I ask, being that we are represented by a few different groups, uh, I'm not sure would NFNC want to ask a question, maybe uh, National Diabetic Centre would want to ask a question. Okay, so Taina. Just a question out of curiosity. What is the most ideal specimen uh, to be collected for genetic testing? 
in this? Uh, well, it can be done on, on saliva, um, and that's more accessible, but blood gives them the best uh, result. Yeah, because once you have blood, you can measure the other biochemical markers at the same time, and it's much more powerful for doing that. But but saliva also, uh, also cheek swab and saliva also uh, uh, work. But the key is um, not just getting the DNA. The DNA by itself has no um, intrinsic value. You need to have measurements on that person whose DNA it is. So you need to have all the de as many details about them as you possibly can, uh, because the more information you have, the more likely you are to, to correlate that, that gene variant. And um, so this, our studies are doing very deep uh, analysis of the metabolic uh, parameters of those people. Um, however, another thing we see as a real opportunity for work in a place like Fiji maybe uh, is um, to have some community where people have lived for a very long time and haven't moved around too much and to get the DNA and look retrospectively at their health records and to look back over time at at how fast they developed diabetes or how fast they developed heart disease uh, and, and other things. Uh, that's much harder to do in New Zealand because people move around all the time and it's hard to track them down or keep track of them. Um, but we think in Fiji that might even be a better way to get answers quickly. So if you are going to do that study in Fiji, will the testing be done? I mean, how will you, the samples that are uh, taken from, if it's blood samples, how will you transport it to New Zealand? Well, we, we would hope that we would set up a research centre here where the DNA would be prepared here and that you would be doing it or here and that it would be a, uh, a research centre here making the DNA and doing all of that stuff. Although the sequencing of the DNA would have to be done um, outside of Fiji, we can't even do it in New Zealand, um, determine people's genome sequences, unfortunately. so. But D yeah, DNA is stable and, um, and, and certainly could be prepared quite, it's relatively straightforward to prepare DNA from white blood cells and could be done here. Thank you. So while we wait for someone to ask the last two questions, um, I just thought that, so, I see the importance of doing indigenous health work, uh, and I see from your from your research that um, I think a good example was how you've identified that um, was it Crab RF, uh, the metformin really being released from from muscle cells. So, in a way, it has helped you tailor make. Well, I guess recommend to clinicians about the tailor making of therapies based on that information. So, I think it helps in that way. Um, and now I'm seeing how important it is that we do research in Fiji that is on indigenous populations for the reasons I think that you've raised and I think that is important. I remember uh, a little time ago when we were talking about a research proposal and the question being asked was why are you looking at the ethnic groups separately? Uh, you are segregating or you are, you know, amounting to something like racism. But I think, I think when we look at it in, in, this, in the research climate that you have highlighted, I think it is important because we may be identifying things that are important. They contribute to how we better uh, tailor make our therapies uh, to the general population. You want to comment on that? More a comment on that. So, um, so in our gout studies in New Zealand, we recruit everyone, okay, people with gout and people without gout without, um, you know, say in Auckland and Dunedin. Um, we do partner with Maori and Pacific organisations as a, as a focus, but more of as a way of partnering and, and having genuine, you know, community en engagement and sharing our knowledge with the community and uh, maybe increasing the chances of translation. But certainly when you're doing genetic studies and, and we do, you have to be looking at, um, because the biggest differences between populations are, or ancestral groups is the word that I will use, um, that we use, is, you know, is, is the genetics. So if we're looking at Gaussian Europeans, we 
compare people with gout who are of European ancestry to people without gout who are of European ancestry. Samoa people with gout or Samoan ancestry compared to people without gout of Samoan ancestry. So we, we don't focus on recruitment on specific groups, but as part of the as a very necessary part of the analysis we do separate out and and certainly when we're asking the question what what's sort of unique about the um, genetics of Maori and Pacific people compared to the other populations in New Zealand, then we will, we will look specifically at Maori and Pacific people. Just one other general comment as well, is that as a, as a New Zealander um, and being involved in genetics for many years and being able to, I think, foresee the future, we will get genetic testing um, being applied from overseas studies for Europeans and Asian people in, in New Zealand, but that won't necessarily be the case for Maori and Pacific people. And so that's one strong justifier for me to be involved in this research and so that we don't accidentally, as geneticists, increase disparities by bringing in um, new medical approaches and intervention approaches from overseas that work better on a particular subpopulation uh, or, or population in New Zealand and will work less well on others. Yeah, well, it'll be defined by whether or not that individual has that gene, right? And essentially what all of these studies across the world are doing is building up a library of genetic variants that affect health in a particular way. And as Tony points out, Europeans are very well covered by this, by the work the Americans are doing. We don't need to, we couldn't beat them anyway. They're already way ahead of us. Um, there's a lot of work already be done, being done on uh, uh, Indian people in the UK and in India. And that will be very transposable to the populations here because it'll be the same broad genetic patterns. Uh, and that's going to be very important for your medical system. And so one advantage of getting sort of some foothold in this sort of research area here in Fiji will be to upskill and train people in the next, next generation of, uh, uh, of uh, doctors and nurses about these methods of, um, you know, of, of pharmacogenetics and genetic methods linking to health. Um, and like I say, a lot of that information will be available online for, for the rest of us, but nobody at the moment is really seriously doing it for the, the people of Pacific uh, ancestry, and that's where there's a gap. That, that, so it's not a matter of racism or anything like that. It's about playing our part and filling in that gap in the world knowledge of genetic information so that everyone in the world is equally covered by genetic uh, um, medicine in the future. And does environment have effect on the genes? No. Uh, I mean, your genes are fixed. So like there are people in various parts of the world, mm. but Pacific is somehow different. Yeah. Is it because of the environment or is it so many years ago it is, the, it is the people have changed? Yeah, he'll, he'll tell you that. So genes don't change very fast. You are, we're stuck with genes unless there's a dramatic selection event like an asteroid hits the, the world or something like that. As Tony explained, there was a recent event kind of like that when all these epidemics of European diseases hit the Pacific. Uh, half, some, in some uh, islands, half the population died of some of these epidemics, right? And that must have had some genetic component as to who lived, right? But in terms of metabolic disease, uh, you know, it will take tens or hundreds of generations of people to go through any selection process of, of genes. So in terms of the modern environment, which has only hit us in the last 100 years, really, 50, 100 years, our genes can't change that fast. We have the genes that we always had. It's just how they are able to deal with this modern environment we now face ourselves in. And I'll give you one really good example, which I don't think I mentioned before, which is the people from um, Greenland, the Inuit people in Greenland. Uh, now, they had a diet. They lived in a very cold climate where they couldn't grow any vegetables or crops, and they live basically off fish and seals and stuff like that, right? When the Western diet came along, it found there was a subgroup of them, a few percent of them, who got terrible diabetes very, very quickly. And it turns out they have a mutation in a gene called, variant in a gene called TBC1D4, 
and that stops insulin from working on glucose in muscle. And so they just cannot handle lots of glucose coming into their diet from elsewhere. So they were fine when they were eating fish and seals, but they are just terribly adapted to this new diet that suddenly got thrust upon them. And so that's how we've got to think about genes, is that we're, we're given the genes we are, they're suited for certain purposes, and if we suddenly change the job we ask our body to do, uh, we might not be well equipped for that. And I guess this is what we're, we're, we're planning to find out uh, through, through that. I mean, I, I think uh, without wanting to bore you, Tony gets bored by this when I tell him this, but if we only think back um, a few generations, maybe a, a, a few thousand years ago before agriculture started, we basically were hunter-gatherers, weren't we? Humans got, got a little bit of food from here and a little bit of food from there and a little bit of food from there. Uh, and most of our production of blood sugar would have come through gluconeogenesis, through our liver, through making new glucose through our liver. Well, we've switched our body now through agriculture and easy production of food to actually uh, getting uh, glucose from our diet instead of from our liver. So we've switched our system. We're asking our body to do a completely different job in the modern world that it never had to do uh, 10,000 years ago. And I don't think our genes have evolved fast enough to cope with that. I think we'll find that we're asking our body to do jobs that probably wasn't originally designed very well for. Uh, so, but I, I, the real genetic explanation will come from China. Well, answered enough, but one the environment can affect the way the genes we inherit work through a process called epigenetics where it modifies the DNA, uh, not the actual genetic variants, but the, uh, the backbone of the DNA. It modifies it and influences the way the, where and how the genes are expressed. And that's the field of epigenetics, which is um, burgeoning. And sometimes these genetic variants can interact with the environment in a very unpredictable way, such that people sometimes with a, what we might consider a good genetic variant with respect to metabolic disease, if they're exposed to an um, unfavourable environmental exposure, that good genetic variant can suddenly switch to be bad, and there are getting to be some examples of that. All right. Uh, is that good? Did someone else uh, have a burning question? No? Uh, you? No? Did you have a question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. I just have a, a short question uh, regarding your uh, research. Is there a variant between a childhood obesity and adulthood obesity? Childhood and adult? Yeah. Um, we, we, don't, we don't know um, in terms of genetics, but what's really interesting is uh, some of the genes we didn't talk about today. Uh, there are some of the genes showing up in the Pacific that are in, in a, type, a subtype of diabetes called maturity onset diabetes of the young, or MODI. So you all know there's type 1 diabetes and there's type 2 diabetes, but in between there's this group of patients who get who don't get the autoimmune diabetes, but are getting diabetes when they're 25, 30 through Modi. And some of those genes are showing up in our screens, and we're starting to wonder whether some of the childhood obesity could be linked to that, to an increased risk through the, having those genes. So it's a really important question to understand that, that time uh, in life when you get diabetes, and is that genetically programmed, or is it just that we are having uh, you know, too much food and too much uh, a modern environment thrust upon us too quickly. But I, at least with the genetics, we, we probably will have some answers for that in the next few years. Would that be about right? Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? All right, thank you. Uh, maybe one slight difference about Fiji from the other Pacific countries is that we're a real melting pot of, you'll have a mix in one person of Micronesian, Polynesian, and Melanesian blood and then throw in a little bit of it's a nice fruit salad. Uh, so I'm not sure if that complicates the genetic picture uh, when we're looking at uh, risks and things like that and predispositions. It, it, it doesn't complicate the genetic picture at a broad level, but makes the analysis of you know, okay. doing it just slightly more difficult. Right. But there are plenty of um, you know, 
statistical approaches right, to yeah. account for that. So it's not a major. Sure. The DNA element. just remains the DNA. Yeah. 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 All right. Fair enough. Uh, so, in the interest of time, I know that you want to ask a lot of questions, but thank you very much. Let's give a big hand to, uh, to the two ladies. Did anyone want to ask a question to the two ladies? But they nicely, you know, fed that into the main presentation. Thank you very much again, everyone, for coming. I hope you've, uh, you've uh, learned something today, and thank you once again, uh, Peter, Tony, uh, Offa, and Kyla. Thank you.